What's up guys, after Halloween 6, the franchise was headed to uncertainty. As you all know, I'm a huge fan of Halloween 6, but even I can admit that where do you go from there logically? Uh, the franchise was looking at going direct to video after this. Uh, there was no Jamie Lee Curtis in sight. So H2O is gonna be an interesting one to discuss because this is a movie that uh, saved the franchise really. So I'm looking forward to digging into all that. So anyway, without further ado, I give you H2O Revisited. Halloween H2O stars Jamie Lee Curtis, Josh Hartnett, and is directed by Steve Miner. So what is up guys, how's everybody doing? It feels really good to be back doing another revisited review. My plan is to do at least one of these a month up until the new movie. So all I have left is Resurrection, Rob Zombie's Halloween, and Halloween 3. So hopefully I can get those three knocked out before the release of the new movie. Um, but H2O is gonna be a really interesting one to jump into, to dive. Uh, pretty deep. I've done quite a bit of research on this movie over the past few weeks. Uh, I watched it again last night to put some fresh eyes on it. I've seen it countless times, quite a few times, but one thing that interests me with H2O is it is the one movie that I have sort of a love-hate relationship with. Sometimes I watch it and I have a good time, and then other times I watch it and I'm yelling at the screen. Uh, so last night was, I think, pretty eye-opening to me and uh, looking forward to diving into this one. So first off, let's get into the backstory of H2O. How did we get here? Well, if we start from Halloween 6 right after this, there was a writer, Robert Zapia, who was tasked to write a direct-to-video sequel for Halloween. And his idea um, was to, let's get the franchise away from the whole Thorn storyline. Um, not necessarily stating that it's not canon, but Let's, you know, instead of trying to tie up all those loose ends, trying to explain uh, what the hell was going on in part six, let's remove ourselves from it. Let's take ourselves to an all-girls school. So that part of the story of H2O was really there from the beginning. But it was going to be a direct-to-video movie. And then came along Jamie Lee Curtis. As soon as Jamie Lee Curtis came into the picture, then we are getting a theatrical release. To me, that's a huge pro because, I mean, this would have went into Hellraiser land. It would have been tough to bring the series back to theaters after going direct to video because some might say when you go direct to video, you don't come back. If you do, you're damn lucky. So, Jamie Lee Curtis came in at the perfect time to really save this franchise and we have never had a Halloween movie go direct to video since. You know, the Rob Zombie movies went to theaters and this new one is going to theaters and the Halloween fever is really bigger than ever. So uh, it's a good time to be a Halloween fan, I guess. So really they worked the story around Jamie Lee Curtis coming back in. They still had the, uh, you know, the, the girls school. She was the headmistress. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's take this away from Haddonfield, which is one of my big problems with this movie. And let's put it in kind of a summer environment. Uh, and we'll get into all that with the cons. But we're going to talk about that opening scene in a minute, but just to uh, expound a little bit more on tying in the Thorn trilogy with this one, they still were planning to do that. Uh, they actually wrote in the script uh, this small section where a student in the school actually stands up and reads a newspaper uh, pretty much explaining what happened in 4, 5, and 6. Uh, you know, the child of Laurie Strode who was killed and then... Uh, Lori Strode in this movie goes to the bathroom and throws up because she is still grief stricken over the death of Jamie. I wish they would have kept, uh, kept that in there, but I understand why they didn't because you have a son, Josh Hartnett, and it, I guess it's tough to sympathize with a person who chooses to leave one child but keep another. Uh, and, you know, I think they would have had to do some major character building to bring us around, you know, to Laurie Strode, even though she is a loved character. Uh, you know, that's exposition that we don't have to deal with, so let's just keep that out of there. But um, even in the opening credits, there is uh, some newspaper clippings, and there is still a little bit of evidence there, like the scissors. 
You could say that those scissors could be uh, the ones that killed Rachel or the ones that Jamie Lloyd used to, to uh, stab her stepmother or her foster mother. But like I said, I understand why they left all that stuff out. Why complicate things? But ironically, you know, fast forward, you know, 20 years later, it's really complicated things because now there's so many different timelines to this franchise and that all started with H2O. But this revisited review will be a pro con type of review because this one is one of those movies that does have some really cool things that I want to talk about. And there's a lot of stuff that I don't like about H2O. So we're kind of kind of split it in half. Uh, but first off, that opening scene is actually really good. It, it gets you in the mood. It feels like Halloween. And we have the nurse from the first two movies. So it's nice to have a returning character like that. And then you have uh, a young Joseph Gordon-Levitt who right from the get-go is a very charismatic actor. And you know, a nice little nod to Friday the 13th because Steve Miner who directed this actually directed Friday the 13th parts two and three. But you can tell Joseph Gordon-Levitt's just having a great time with this role. Been suspended five times this year already for getting a little crazy with the stick, all right? He's this hockey player, he's really cocky, he's, he's funny, all this great stuff. So then uh, Myers comes into the picture and we have this battle with uh, the nurse and Myers and it's a good scene. I like this scene. Um, but this scene does kind of set up uh, what I don't like about Myers. I mean, from the first scene when Myers steps into frame, I don't like it. Look at this. This Myers does not look uh, intimidating at all. As shallow as it is, I think physicality is an important thing when it comes to a killer. Kane Hodder can be the exception to the rule because Kane Hodder, I don't believe is that tall. I could be wrong, but he looks like just a bulky short guy. But Chris Duran, even his stance is kind of weird because his, his feet protrude out. I don't know, there's just something about that, but we're gonna get more into a lot of the stuff that I hate about Myers in this movie. And I've already given something away. But if you've seen my first review on Halloween H2O, then you're not surprised. But, um, you know, staying on the good stuff, I like this scene. It's a fun little opening. Also, uh, the opening musical cue is interesting. I'm kind of in the middle on this. Uh, but from this point, I really have a lot of problems with the music in this movie, actually. The opening title credits is probably my favorite part just because it's a beefed up version, an orchestral version of the Halloween movie. But you got the two detectives there and you know the one guy he's stating that michael would be like you know a granddad and then the other guy's like he would actually be younger than you and then you have like the voiceover uh who wasn't loomis it was a voiceover actor that did him but uh you know that was a nice little nod to loomis so some nice things there the blackest eyes the devil's eyes also as far as the characters go and i've i'll go ahead and state the scream comparison here in this section of the review Yes, this came out uh, right after Scream came out. This is in the middle of that whole hoopla. I believe Kevin Williamson might have had a little bit of play in this script as well. I mean, everybody was influenced by Williamson at the time. The guy had his pen on a lot of properties. And so you can't blame them for trying to copy that formula. But for me, Halloween should never copy Scream. It doesn't flat out copy it. But there are some definite similarities. You have to admit that. But as far as the characters go, I do like Josh Hartnett in this role. This is one of his first movies. As a matter of fact, he shot this like back to back with the faculty. And one thing you'll notice about his character in this and the way Josh Hartnett played a lot of his young characters at this time was he had messy hair, as, as shallow as that sounds. And that was on purpose. Behind the scenes, they wanted him to have more of a, um, I guess more put together hairdo uh, like most actors at the time. But uh, Josh Hartnett, he said, you know, when he went to high school, kids didn't look like that. They looked like they were a wreck. They looked like they were a mess. And so before they would say action, he would mess his hair up. And that made him stick out to me. Josh Hartnett is really good in this movie, actually. If there's one thing that I would have loved to carry over from uh, H2O, it would be Josh Hartnett's character, even more so than Jamie Lee Curtis, actually. <laughs> Ah! 
Also, Jamie Lee Curtis saves this movie. I'm gonna put that out there right now. She is really good throughout this whole thing. I like that she's struggling with these demons that she's had to deal with for the past 20 years. I like that they delved into that. And the last act is phenomenal in this movie, really. It is one of the better last acts of the whole franchise. I have to give H2O that. But all that rests on Jamie Lee Curtis's shoulders. Um, as far as Myers goes, I don't think he delivered as much as Jamie Lee Curtis did in the scenes. He did have some nice moments, though, like when he is lowering himself down from the ceiling with one arm. That's some cool stuff. And one can't deny that face-to-face -face moment with Laurie Strode and Myers. It is one of the most iconic scenes in the franchise. For 20 years, everybody wanted Laurie Strode to have to face off with Michael Myers one more time. And they did it perfectly, having them go literally face to face. And then of course, she chops off Michael's head. I can't fault H2O uh, for the mistakes of resurrection, so I won't do that. This in my mind is the proper ending to the series you know for as many problems as i have with h2o it still would have been a respectable ending to the series because of that last act because of laurie strode finally putting an end to all this madness now let's get into the freaking cons of this movie first off let's talk about the mask because it's one of the most debated things about halloween h2o the mask in this movie ruins it for me really puts it pretty low on my ranking for the franchise because there are no less than four different masks. Let me explain. This is a case of having way too many cooks in the kitchen. If anything, producers should learn from H2O. If you are gonna use a mask in a movie, let one person be in charge of that and let them see it through till the end of the movie because there were way too many cooks in the kitchen of H2O. Uh, it started off with Steve Miner wanting a K&B mask, just a blank slate. Sounds good uh, in theory, right? Wrong. The mask actually looks like one of those Walmart masks, and you could say those are a blank slate, but they look really stupid. But the crazy thing to me is they shot for three weeks with this mask, and it's like nobody noticed, until somebody noticed. During daily, somebody said, what the hell? That is not Michael Myers' mask. So we got a problem on our hands. So they called John Carl Beekler, from Halloween 6 to come back, uh, do the 6 mask, but kind of blend it with the Can-B mask, uh, you know, whiten it up a little bit, take, a, take some of the detail off. This mask looked really good. They should have stuck with this mask, pressed forward. But, too many cooks in the kitchen. Steve Miner came into the picture, uh, did, was not informed about this mask, so this is a major communication problem. And so, of course, he had a, he had a fit. He said, I don't want to use this mask. So then he calls up Stan Winston. Stan Winston makes the mask that we see in most of the last act of the movie, especially for all the close-ups. And then we have a CGI mask in one scene. Some of the speculation was that they had already tore down a set, so they couldn't rebuild the set, so they just CGI'd the mask. Horrible decision. Because of the problems of the masks in this movie, for me, it ruins the movie. For some people, it won't ruin the movie. And that's great for you. But for me, I love the character of Myers so much. I hold him so near and dear to my heart that when I see that mask change over and over and over and over again, it completely just ruins the movie for me. It really does. Call it shallow, call it what you want. That's just me. I hate that about this movie. Uh, and there are more problems with this movie, which we will get into. But the mask is the biggest. Then, Chris Durant. Nothing against Chris Durand as an actor. He's a great stunt actor, actually. He did some stunt work for Scream. Um, but, like I said, superficially, I don't like the way the guy looks in the suit. I don't like the way the guy walks. To me, Michael Myers is a whole package. The way that George P. Wilbur walked is, like, chilling. Bone chilling. Scary as hell. He proved it in Halloween 4. He proved it in Halloween 6. Nick Castle, same thing. The guy has just such a chilling walk. 
Chris Durant's approach in this movie was to kind of treat him like a cat, like a hunter, you know, zeroing, zeroing in on its prey. And he really had no past history with Myers. He wasn't like a big fan. So he went into this kind of blind with doing no homework, which that is a method. Some actors do that and it works for some. Malcolm McDowell did it for Loomis. Didn't work at all. Same thing here. I think it's passable, some of the stuff he does in the movie, but for the most part, I wasn't scared. I wasn't intimidated by him. There was just something about the way Chris Duran played the part that did not work for me. And in his credit, when you're putting on three different masks throughout a shoot, you're probably gonna lose some of your vigor, some of your passion for the role. So I'll cut him some slack for that. If I was playing Myers in this movie and I had to put on three different masks, I probably would have threw some shit too. I probably would have been pissed off. But in the end, we're stuck with this, this movie where we're seeing constant mass changes throughout the movie. Sometimes in the same scene. Next up, the score. Halloween is one of my favorite scores of all time. Probably my favorite score of all time. And they screwed it up in H2O. Steve Miner got with John Ottman and he wanted to make more of a Hitchcock type of score. Wrong idea. Psycho and Halloween are completely different in terms of score. They just are. The reason Halloween works so well, or one of the reasons, is because of that score. This score felt more orchestral. It's interesting to listen to sometimes, and it's more of a hybrid too. Here's another case of too many cooks in the kitchen. John Ottman, you know, put forth this whole score and they only ended up using half of it. That's the long story short of it. Uh, just because of, you know, creative differences between the filmmakers behind the scenes. So the score in this movie feels like a hodgepodge. Sometimes you have the Marco Beltrami score, which just sounds like Scream, and then sometimes you have the Ottman score but it's all over the place. And then they ran out of time, so they had to plug in the original John Carpenter score for the credits, which is my favorite part of the movie, actually. And then my last problem with this movie is just, it doesn't feel like the holiday of Halloween, for the most part. It feels like a summer movie. Uh, I missed that Haddonfield, eerie, gritty vibe. This feels polished. This feels like a bigger production. And I wanted, more of an independent uh, style to this. I think Halloween works best when it feels uh, a little bit more low budget, a little bit more independent, and really just fall-like, you know? I, mean, I love all the leaves in Halloween 6 and all those previous movies. Halloween 4, I think, nails it the best as far as the atmosphere goes. This movie has none of that. So by the end, when, I, when I'm done with H2O, luckily they put all the good stuff at the very end, but the damage is done. There's just so much stuff before that awesome ending where she chops his head off that just kind of ruined the movie for me. It's not a bad movie overall, but it's not one that um, I constantly throw in. You know, as the years have gone on, I find myself picking other Halloween movies before I pick H2O. Funny enough though, like, you know, most non-Halloween fans are gonna pick H2O. And maybe that's just because they don't wanna dig deep into the whole thorn storyline and all that and who can blame them you know but i'm i'm noticing that a lot of halloween fanatics don't place h2o so high and i'm one of those guys so in the end for a rating though i will give h2o uh i guess a low humdrum some massive massive potential there but i think it just falls short because of the score because of myers because of the mask because of the the atmosphere it really screws up a lot of things and you know to me they stick out like a sore thumb to you they might not but that's just the way it is so anyway guys what are your thoughts on halloween h2o let me know in the comments i know i'm going to get a lot of back and forth on this one because this is one of those movies that people love it and then some people are like me they hate it so i'm looking forward to getting into the comments with you guys 
and discussing it. And on Killer Flicks. Make sure you come over to Killer Flicks, become a member, where we talk horror all day and every day. And on Fridays, we do free for all Fridays. Also, today, I just hit 15,000 subscribers and I'm just completely floored. Like, I can't thank you guys enough. It's, it's if you would have told me that I would be at 15,000 subscribers, I would have told you you were crazy. It, this is one of those things that when I, when I was early in my YouTube days, I would look up to people that had this, this many subscribers thinking there's no way I would ever achieve this goal. But thank you so much for getting me here. I would not be here without you guys. Anyway guys, follow me at Dum Dums on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and now Stardust. If you like what I'm doing, hit that subscribe button. I'd really appreciate it. Anyway guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day. Drum Dum out.